This is the first tape in Volume 1 of an ongoing series of audio tapes entitled The Forum Presents, Conversations with Werner Erhard. The Forum is designed as a public arena in which the applications of transformation in day-to-day life are explored. A wide range of topics in the areas of productivity, workability, and the business of living life come up for scrutiny, serious dialogue, and action in the Forum. This series of three audio tapes is excerpted from sessions held in August of 1983. The first tape of Volume 1 is entitled Defining Your Life. Werner begins by taking a look at how we experience ourselves, a subject he's been addressing with the forum participants. So first I want to start with something we've been talking about for the last couple of days. And the first thing I'd like to uh, do is to invite you to take a look at the fact that probably in your best moments uh, you are let's say, unaware of yourself, that when things are really going well and something's happening, you don't even notice yourself. It's like you're not there. Uh, Maybe another way of saying that, and a little bit more accurate way of saying it, is that when things are going well, you are transparent. You know, when, uh, I'll just give you some kind of hints at uh, places you can look to verify what uh, we've just said. Uh, if you think about when you're working and the work is really going well and you're really into the work, I mean, you don't even notice yourself. You're not aware of yourself. You are transparent and what's showing up is the work that you're doing. That's all that's kind of there and present for you is the work that you're doing. Uh, If you're really having fun doing something, let's say you're playing tennis or you're swimming or you're dancing, you don't have any attention on yourself. You don't have any awareness of yourself. Uh, That is to say, you as yourself is transparent, and what's there is the activity in which you're engaged. And that's probably very apparent for you. I mean, that's really, really, really present. So uh, it's interesting because this uh, vaunted and uh, highly regarded thing called myself is during the best moments not there it's transparent it's not something on which we have any attention it isn't present i mean it may be there but it isn't present in the best moments we're not present i don't know i think there's something interesting (laughs) about that but uh i'd like to invite you to notice when you show up and i suggest that when you show up is as soon as something isn't going well. (laughs) All of a sudden, the transparency disappears and you become very present. Like, uh, let's say you're playing tennis and you're really into the game and it's going well and there's these great volleys and rallies and everything's going well and the ball's going back and forth and, you know, it's a great game and your opponent's playing right up at his or her best level, and you're right up at your best level, and the whole thing is going well. And Of course, when it's really going well, you're a little ahead, but not, not, not stupidly ahead, just a little bit ahead, and you're really engaged and really in there. Or maybe it's your work. You use whatever scene you like. But, uh, you know, the ball comes over, and, it's, and you're right in the swing of things, and you bring your uh, racket around, but you don't even know you're bringing your racket around. And uh, you flub the shot. Now, I think if you can picture that or get a memory of that or something similar to that in your own experience, you'll see that the first kind of question that comes up is something about, oh, I, something. It's like, I, something. And uh, so then you show up. Or it's, uh, what did I do? Or, oh, that was stupid. Something like that. But at any rate, you become present for the first time. The work now recedes a little bit. The play now recedes a little bit. The activity now recedes a little bit. And you show up like a presence. And what happens invariably in those moments, and we could call those moments a problem, or we could call those moments a breakdown, or we could give whatever name we like but something's gone wrong. Suddenly the kind of at-oneness is gone and there you are 
And the first thing that shows up, and I want you to notice this because it's a very powerful insight, that when you show up, you show up like an assessment. A kind of saying something about something. Oh, that's terrible. I made a mistake. That shouldn't have happened. I wonder what went on. Something like that. But at any rate, I want us to see that when we show up, we show up like an assessment. So I'm suggesting, I'm inviting you to consider the possibility that who you are, like yourself, that is to say, whenever you show up, when you're not transparent, the way you show up is as assessment. So we're now talking about self as assessment. Now, you can get a pretty good glimpse of yourself very readily by uh, not speaking and not doing anything and just being quiet and seeing what's there. Now, probably what's there is you'll have some sensations in your body. Uh, we're not going to talk about the self as sensations in the body for the moment. Uh, what may be there is, uh, I don't know, a kind of vague, general, overall feeling. I would call that mood, maybe. But what you'll notice more poignantly, more strikingly than almost anything, unless one of those two is in very bad shape, what you probably notice is the conversation going on in your head, or as we say, going on in your head. You know, that little voice back here which keeps commenting on things and discussing things and making comments on things and actually comments about the mood. And when it isn't commenting about the mood, it's sometimes commenting about the sensations in the body. And when it's not commenting on those two things, it's commenting on something out there or something that happened back there or something that's going to happen or might happen. And it kind of keeps going around in circles. Well, that voice is self as assessment or it's a kind of manifestation. That's the word I want. It's a manifestation of self as assessment. And if you listen to the voice, it's weighing and judging and concluding and analyzing and like that. It's making assessments. So that's when you or I show up. We show up as assessment. Well, I know that's a very strange way to talk about ourselves. And I repeat again, I'm only talking about ourselves that way because in speaking about ourselves this way, even though it sounds strange, it will actually make some impact on ourselves. See, if you say self as soul or spirit, if you say self as mind, if you say self as history, I mean, there are very interesting ways of talking about the self, and a lot of people have spoken about self in that way. But uh, while you can have a very interesting, complex conversation, when the interesting complex conversation is all over, there hasn't been much impact on self. So I'm looking for a way to talk about self that has an impact, and I'm suggesting to you that this way of talking about ourself does have an impact. That if you just left here kind of in the possibility, kind of being with the possibility, kind of allowing the possibility of yourself as assessment that there would be something powerful happening for you. So now we have a new possibility of self. Not the right one, not the best one, a new one. And I say that this new one is the possibility Treating self as assessment opens up a possibility of having an impact on our lives. So now I want to see what the assessment is. What kind of assessment? You notice I'm proposing that there's two kinds of assessments. First, I'm going to put the one up here, which I think we are generally, ordinarily, uh, namely that we are a psychological assessment that 
the way you and I are, the way we show up, the way we come onto the scene, the way when you're really noticing yourself, you'll notice yourself, is as a psychological assessment. So this is being as psychological assessment. Let me give some examples of psychological assessments. Uh, I did that because almost anything you put in after that is a psychological assessment because the notion of because is a psychological assessment. That is to say, cause as expressed in the word because belongs in the domain of psychological assessment. Let me give you some other words for because uh, or cause. Sometimes that shows up as a justification. So justification. Lots of the psychological assessment turns out to be a justification for something or other. Or an explanation for something or other or a rationalization, or a reason. By the way, you can put under being as psychological assessment all characterization. So, uh, when you meet somebody or think about somebody in the normal course of events you kind of make a characterization about them oh they're great or uh, they're great but they have this little problem that they're uh, um, silly or stupid or oh they he's a jerk that he's a jerk that's a that's a characterization so characterizations and justifications and explanations and rationalizations and reasons, they're all psychological assessment. Uh, what's wrong is a uh, question uh, inviting a psychological assessment. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with it? That's uh, all possibilities in a psychological assessment. And you'll notice that whenever you've got a problem, whenever something breaks down, whenever something's gone wrong, that almost the first thing that will happen is some psychological assessment. And it will often be about you. Like, what's wrong with you? Okay, so I'm proposing an alternative. I'm inviting you to consider an alternative way of being alternative to psychological assessment, and for lack of a better word, I'll call it philosophical assessment. By the way, psychological assessment is not something you do. It's something you are. And it's not the way you made yourself. Uh, you got born into psychological assessment. You can say that the society is psychological assessment or the culture is psychological assessment. At least the society and culture into which you and I got born is one of psychological assessment. So this philosophical assessment is not one into which we got born. It has to be uh, created for yourself. You have to bring it forth for yourself. You have to generate it for yourself. And uh, it's very, very simple. To uh, live being philosophical assessment is to live as your word. To live as a philosophical being means to live with commitment or really to live as commitment 
to live as your commitments, to live committedly. It means to live with a commitment to completion. A derivative from that would be to live with a commitment to wholeness, to being whole. To be a philosophical being means to live with a commitment to communication. So, to be a philosophical being means to live with a commitment to authenticity. To be a philosophical being means to live with a commitment to integrity. So, to be philosophical is to do your assessment on the basis of your word, to do your assessment on the basis of commitment, to do your assessment on the basis of integrity, to do your assessment on the basis of completion, to do your assessment on the basis of authenticity and communication. So you're still going to show up like assessment, because that's what the self is, is assessment. When it's there, what's there is assessment. And for the most part, people have no choice. The assessment's very automatic. Because for the most part, most of us have not even entertained the possibility that who we are is assessment. We think we do assess things. I'm not saying that you and I do assess things. I'm saying that you and I are assessment. You know, if you are doing assessment, then let's see you stop that little voice in the back of your head. You just sit quietly and don't think. Turn off the voice in the back of your head. If you're doing it, stop doing it. And if you are doing it, then you stop doing it. I'll tell you when it stops. It stops when you stop. If there's no self, that voice shuts up. But if there's a self, that voice is there. So that's self as assessment. Now, most people haven't even entertained the possibility. So most people have never given themselves the chance to know themselves as they are, I'll call it, thrown to be. T-H-R-O-W-N, thrown to be. It's like the way you show up when you become yourself for yourself is as assessment and you are that and you are that as a psychological assessment with this stuff because that's the way you're thrown to be. It's very interesting to watch that phenomenon in uh, infants when they start being themselves for themselves. It doesn't happen right away. So most people don't know, A, that this is what they are, and therefore obviously don't now recognize that they've got a choice. But as, this, as you become willing to experiment with this, as you become willing to live with this, as you become willing to be inside the possibility of it, then the choices begin to show up, and one of the choices is to live as a philosophical being. Next, Werner talks about the qualities of a psychological being. In particular, he looks at the nature of most of the conversation in that domain and suggests that for the most part, it has no impact on life. You notice when you say it's a nice day, nothing happens to the day? That's chattering. Did you have a good weekend? Oh, great, you had a good weekend. That's great. Have a nice weekend. That's chattering. And there's nothing wrong with chattering. I'm not against chattering. I mean, some chatter seems to be appropriate. 
But when that's all there is, that's a little questionable. Now, some people are chattering with a very heavy load. I mean, chattering is not always light. Some chattering is very, 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 very heavy. You know, you listen to people talking about nuclear war or nuclear weapons or that whole issue about nuclear this and that. And that's very heavy, and some of them are very heavy about it. But if you listen to it, it's all chatter. It's all their opinion or their belief. You know, if you go into a diner for a cup of coffee and there's just you in the diner, some, some people have these experiences in bars, but I'm from the East Coast. There are diners on the East Coast, you see. So we go into a diner and there's just the guy behind the diner and you and you have a cup of coffee and you get into a conversation, the guy behind the diner, sorry, the guy behind the counter in the diner knows everything. There is no subject about which you can speak that he does not have an opinion. And he is rabid about the opinion. I mean, he's really into the opinion. And if you listen to most conversations about nuclear issues or politics or religion, a heavy subjects, illness, the economy, raising children, relationships. If you listen to those conversations, I think you'll see that for the most part, there are a bunch of people who work in diners having an opinion about everything or anything. That's all chatter. So there's plenty of words in this psychological domain plenty of words, but they all show up like chattering. They show up like opinions and beliefs. Usually people say, I think. And then what follows is chattering, their opinion. So we're talking about showing up as your word as something different than chattering. So, there's a kind of wording that's clearly not chattering. Now, it can be turned into chatter, but as its real self, it's not chattering. Promise or promising is not chattering. It's a different kind of wording. And uh, something worth looking into. A promise is distinguished in the philosophy of language as a speech act. So I'll repeat that. A promise is distinguished in the philosophy of language as a speech act. So a promise is an action. And that's very strange, don't you think? I mean, everybody knows that words are not actions. Just like at one time everybody knew the world was flat. And everybody knew man would never step on the moon. So everybody knows that words aren't actions. And yet there are serious people, very serious people, people not kidding, people who have devoted their whole lives and their intellect to uh, the study of language who say that there are speech acts. And they say that a promise is one of those. And it's interesting. Specifically, promise is that kind of speech act called a performative. 
It actually performs. And I'll show you about it. So if you say, I promise the use of the word promise in that saying is itself a promise. See, if I talk about the chair, the use of the word chair, the word chair is not itself a chair. If I talk about a hand, the word hand is not itself a hand. But if I say, I promise, I am promising by saying promise. And promise is a very special category of saying. In the philosophy of speech acts, it's a performative. It actually performs. It acts. Now, it's interesting because it's possible to uh, make a promise not a promise. Now, I'll show you how to make a promise not a promise. Uh, I want to lose weight. See, I want to lose weight. The statement, I want to lose weight, is not wanting. And it's not weight. The word I is not I. The word want is not itself wanting. The word weight doesn't weigh anything much. The word lose, that's not losing. That's what people do at New Year's. They make resolutions, which are really not performatives. That is to say, they're not acts. They're uh, descriptions. I want to lose weight is a description of an internal state. It's a description of the state, the internal state called wanting to lose weight. I wish I could lose weight. It's a description of an internal state. Some place in there you have the notion that there's a wish, and you're describing that internal state called wishing. I should lose weight. That's a description of a, an assessment. It's not a promise. I would like to promise. That's not a promise either. That's a description of an internal state. The only thing which is in fact a promise is I promise. So, to show up as your word is to show up as promising. To show up as an assessment of yourself as your word, to show up as a philosophical being, is to show up as assessing your promises, like promises. Now, it's very interesting when you do a philosophical assessment assessment of a promise, here are the possibilities. I promised or I didn't promise. I kept my promise. I didn't keep my promise. Or I am keeping my promise. I am not keeping my promise. 
And uh, that's about it. That's the whole conversation. I mean, if you live like your word, at least in this instance, it starts to get very quiet inside your head. There's not much you around. But you remember back to the beginning of this conversation? When life's really good, there's not much you around. There's the work or the play or the person or life. So this philosophical way of being, this living as a philosophical assessment, when something goes wrong or there's a breakdown or there's a problem, to do a philosophical assessment gets you right back to work or right back to playing or right back to being. There's some real value in it. Now, promises, however, because they're mostly assessed in a psychological domain, most people think that not keeping your promise is bad. That's a psychological assessment. And in a psychological domain, I suppose it's even true that not keeping your promise is bad. But in a philosophical domain, not keeping your promise is not keeping your promise. That's what it is. And it's not more or less than that. Now, assuming that not keeping your promise is not bad, assuming not keeping your promise is not keeping your promise, what would a person do if what they did was to not keep their promise? Well, they would probably clean up the damage done by not keeping their promise. They would probably say to whoever they made the promise to, I didn't keep my promise, I apologize. Wouldn't be a whole big victim number or guilt or blame or a lot of rationalizations and justifications there would be just the kind of simple acknowledgement that I made a promise, I didn't keep the promise. And an expression of responsibility, since you are living at, as your word, for the consequences of not keeping your promise. You know, whatever those consequences may be. Maybe it's a new promise. I told you I would be here at such and such a time. I wasn't here at that time. I was late. I promised to be on time from now on. See, I want you to see how that leaves the person listening as contrasted with, gee, I'm real sorry. No kidding. I really feel bad about not showing up on time. But I want you to know that traffic was terrible and I was trying to get out of the house and the kids knocked over the lamp and I had to stop and get the lamp fixed. And while I was picking up the lamp, we knocked over the pitcher, uh, I mean the flower vase and the water went all over the place. And it's just terrible. Now, what were we going to do together? And don't you want to hear some more promises from me? I don't think so. I think, A, you don't want to do anything with me, and B, you certainly don't want to hear any more promises from me. But if I can say to you, look, I promised to be here at 9 o'clock. It's 9.30. I'm late. And I promise you I won't be late anymore. And if there was some cost or some consequence to my being late, is there some way I can make up for it? You notice that the thing kind of goes away when you can handle it like that? Now, never mind what it feels like for the other guy. What does it feel like for the guy who isn't making the justifications and the rationalizations and the excuses and feeling badly about it and all that stuff? What's it like for that person? Well, I'll tell you what it's like for that person. What it's like for that person is like nothing. It's like disappearing. It's like that not being present. It's like just being. It's like being, like being transparent. And so life is showing up instead of all this assessment. Now, most of us don't know what life would be like lived like that. 
I mean, really, we don't know what it would be like lived like that. And I'm not saying I know, I'm not saying I don't know. But I'm inviting you to see. What would it be like to live like that? What would it be like to be thoroughly engrossed in life What would, it li what, would it, what would it be like to have problems or breakdowns come up and handle the assessment so rapidly that you were back working on it, being with it, just like you were before the breakdown happened, but now you're with the breakdown like that. Like you were with the work, you're now with the breakdown. Like you were with the fun, you're now with the repairing the breakdown. I mean, what would it be like? I don't know. I think that that's what people call being alive. That's my suspicion. I think it would be like being, really being alive. So my talking to you about this, is not designed like a recipe or like a prescription. In other words, I'm not telling you how to do this. This is not a recipe or prescription. I'm offering it to you and sharing it with you like a possibility, like a question you might be asking yourself, like something you might explore for yourself, like something you might check out for yourself like a question you might live with for a number of days, just to see what you can see for yourself. 